All right, good morning. Uh, welcome to the gathering. Um, most of us are out there live streaming this morning, and uh, it's, it's a different day. We were gathering in here the last couple of weeks, but praise God for technology. We get to continue to gather via live stream. So if you are joining with us online, uh, you can go to our website, thegatheringchurch.net, thegatheringchurch.net, and there's a link on there that has the song sheets. And so you can click on that and you can pull the words up. Uh, for the songs. And so, yeah, we're just going to do what we do. And I have a few people here, so I'm not necessarily speaking to an empty room. So thank you for being here, folks. And thank you for Matt and Gabe and the technology up there. You guys are a blessing to us. So, um, as I always do every week, I always want to remind us that uh, we believe that following Jesus is the best way to go. And we're striving to learn what that looks like learning together, growing together learning how to live and love like Jesus so that as we live our lives in the world, others will come to know the Jesus that we have found, the Jesus that we're living into. And that's always my hope and prayer. And then as we gather in moments like this, this is actually a chance to celebrate um, that life that we are experiencing um, out there in the world. And then at the same time, I believe we get to practice things that ought to be a part of our daily rhythm of life. I mean, we ought to have worship in our life. We ought to have some teaching moments in our life where God is speaking to us in our life, and we, we ought to be praying, so this kind of puts us in a mode, if we haven't been living that way during the week, where we get to, we get to, to do that for a moment, so, um, so I just pray that this morning, um, God would speak to us, uh, I pray that we have open hearts and open minds, that we would be able to not only honor him and celebrate him, but then recognize that he's going to um, speak into our lives, so um, you guys hear me say around here all the time that um, I really believe that God is at work. God is always at work. Jesus said, I'm always at work, just as my Father is always at work. And we're getting to experience that here in our church with the food pantry that's going on uh, right behind me in the parking lot here a couple of days a week. And we're just seeing God continue to provide in miraculous ways. Uh, folks, you need to know that even in the last couple of days, you know, the room's been somewhat empty of food back there, but we continue to have money donations coming in so that we can purchase food. Uh, turkeys are coming in so that we can provide those for families during um, this Christmas and, thank Christmas and Thanksgiving season. And for me, that, that's worth celebrating. I mean, that is God's grace. Um, when I was having my devotional time this morning, um, I was reading in Ezekiel 34. And I just want to share those words with you because I really believe it conveys the heart of God. And so these are the words of God to the prophet Ezekiel. He said, I myself will tend my sheep and give them a place to lie down in peace. I will search for my lost ones who strayed away and I will bring them safely home again. I will bandage the injured and strengthen the weak. And I think that's just um, an amazing example of God's grace for us. God's grace isn't something that we just receive in terms of forgiveness, but grace is this ongoing work, a divine work that God's doing in us. It's a work that he's doing through us, and his grace is always at work around us. He wants to take care of us. And the nice thing is, regardless of where we are in our journey through life, he's always going to that grace to draw us back to him. And actually, I just love that. So, so let's pray, and then we'll sing a few songs, and, and I'll teach you a little bit this morning. So would you pray with me? Uh, Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning. I just thank you for another new day. I thank you that um, every new day has in it an opportunity to live into new life. Oh, Lord, I thank you for the fact that you care for us. You care for us when we're, we're kind of on track and life's going good, and you care for us when life is sideways. And, and I love that about you. I love the fact that, that you pursue us. I love the fact that your heart desires that we would be able to live in a place of peace. And Lord, we acknowledge that in our world right now, life is not peaceful. And Lord, I know that's not of you your heart is that we would be able to have peace. Lord, our world needs grace. Our world needs grace. We need your grace everywhere. We need your grace in every life. We need your grace in every action. And Lord, your grace begins with us. And Lord, to me, your grace is amazing. It's unchanging. It's always there. And as you look at our lives, even when they're broken and messy, you take great joy in us because you see us 
as your workmanship, something that you're doing, that you're changing, you're molding, you're making us into something that's better than ourselves. And Lord, I'm so grateful for that. Uh, Lord, this morning as we, we celebrate who you are, may we take joy in our lives right now, regardless of the circumstances. May we take joy knowing that your grace is at work. And may we look forward to the new that you're going to do in our life today, the new you're, that you're going to do in our life tomorrow. You're, you're about something new. You're always about something new. So the current circumstances of our life, Lord, we don't have to look to those. We can put our hope in what you're doing and what you're going to do. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
All right, let me change gears here a little bit. A little housekeeping, move some things around. <laughs> awesome. Well, uh, again, welcome. Glad you're here with us. Um, just a few announcements uh, for us who call this our church community. Um, first of all, if you've been watching us um, online, um, you can always go to our website. Um, I know many of you watch us every week. And I'd love to know who you are, and I'd love to get to know you. So you can actually go to our website, thegatheringchurch.net, and on there, there's a circle that says, I'm new. And you can click on it, and you can give us a little bit of information. Um, and we'd love to, just to get to know you as you get to know us. Um, our tithes and offerings, uh, you can always give online. You can drop off an envelope here in the, the church um, mail deposit slot, or you can mail it in. But I just want to thank you for your faithfulness um, and your tithes and offerings and giving to our church uh, God's been just blessing us. We've been continuing to um, just live into who we are without the worry of provision, and you've been a huge part of that. So thank you so much uh, for your giving. Um, just in terms of things that are coming up, um, I know everybody's emotions and anxiety can get really high, and you'll be getting information on this, but uh, December 9th, save that date, December 9th, we're going to have a catalyst training. And for those of you who don't know what that word means, it, we're just using the words out of Hebrews um, and just talking about how when we're together, we can be an encouragement to one another, and it's just a chance to learn and grow together. And so we're going to talk about what to do with all the emotions we're experiencing right now. We're going to have one evening from 7 to 8, do a little webinar. Um, and so I'd love to have you guys uh, join us in that. And then as part of our tradition in this church, uh, we do a Thanksgiving offering um, every year. And so over the next couple of weeks, we're going to be doing that. Um, there's a special category if you give online for that. If you drop off an envelope, you can just say Thanksgiving offering. But this is what it's going to go to this year. And I'm actually excited about this because I believe God's preparing us for what's next. So um, most of our building has been fixed up and renovated and everything through the years. But we have this other side, which is where the kids hang out. And so what we're going to do is our offering this year, our Thanksgiving offering is going to go towards helping us recarpet that side of the building and paint the classrooms and really make it an inviting, a wonderful place for kids as they come here to our church. And we love, and here's the cool thing that, that I love is we always take a portion of this offering and we tithe off it to our missionaries that are out there. So many of you know some of the different families, the Norens, the Sanchez's, um, KCI, AI, AI <laughs> Case. The Alaskan Christian radio station. 
I can't, can't get it right. But anyway, we're going to give some money to them as well. And so we want to support ministries that are, are beyond us. So know that our Thanksgiving offering is in gear right now. So you can uh, give to that. And, um, and I look forward to um, how God will use that as a blessing. And then in terms of our food pantry, I'm just going to throw this out there. Um, we have all kinds of cash donations coming in, which I have mentioned. But um, let me just say this. If you're up for it, if you go to Winco and you spend over $100 in groceries, they give us a free turkey. They give you a free turkey. And so I'm just encouraging as many of us, just shift your shopping pattern for one week and go there. And you can get a turkey and you can donate it um, so that we have uh, turkeys um, and chickens and stuff like that to give out at Christmas. And we are preparing Christmas boxes for families that come through our food pantry uh, every week. And we're going to be getting more information to you on that. So I think that's it. I think that's all the announcements of what we need to do. So when you bring your turkeys and the turkeys are frozen, someone just asked me a question out here. Um, you can bring them on Mondays or Wednesdays uh, during our time that we're open for the food pantry from 12 to 4, or you can bring them by here on Sunday when we're here. So good question. Thank you for asking that. There are actually people here in the room. All right, so we're going to continue um, our uh, message series that we're in. We're calling it Waymakers um, because God, God has already done a lot to pave the way for us to continue his ways in the world. So we, in a sense, are his way makers. And we've been going through um, the letter of Ephesians uh, that Paul wrote to Ephesus. And so if you want to turn there in your Bibles, we're going to be in Ephesians um, chapter 4, picking up where we left off. So, um, gosh, years ago, five years ago, six years ago, um, I found myself personally having to navigate through a life moment that I did not expect. Those of you who know me know that I'm incredibly active, athletic, and everything. And for some reason, around 2014, these hips that I have just started to go. And um, they, they went so bad, the arthritis was so bad, that all of a sudden my life was filled with huge limitations. Huge limitations. I couldn't do what I was used to doing. And my days actually started to be spent managing pain arthritic pain, deep arthritic pain. And that sort of started to become my new normal. Now I knew in my heart of hearts, even though it was incredibly discouraging, that God wasn't done with me yet. And I had a choice to make. I could wallow in discouragement, and there was a lot of it, and I found myself there. Or I could live in hope and prepare for the mysterious what's next. And I honestly didn't know what that was going to look like. Well, I discovered that what's next was going to actually be surgery. Not only one, but two. And they were going to be spread out over time, and it was going to involve a lot of rehabilitation of my body physically. But I realized in the midst of it, because I was having to sit in this painful place, that it was also going to require some surgery and rehabilitation of my heart. And so in my limitations, God had this incredible opportunity to prepare me inside for what was next because I could not escape the circumstances that I was in. I don't know if you guys remember this, but there, there's this incredible moment, and it's a huge moment in our life as Jesus followers where Jesus was crucified. A horrific death. And those who followed him were a witness to it. And they thought Jesus was going to come and change everything. They had hopes, they had expectations, and then he's killed on the cross, brutally, and he's buried in a tomb. And those who are following Jesus, they kind of scattered. I mean, oh my gosh, it's over. But when you look at the Gospels carefully, I find it interesting that the women had a different response. It says in Scripture that the women went to make preparations. They made preparations because Jesus had been buried and there were preparations that you do for someone who died back then in terms of their burial. So they made preparations. And then they took those preparations after the Sabbath because you couldn't go do anything on the Sabbath. After the Sabbath, and they went to the tomb. And as they got to the tomb, the stone had been rolled away and they got to experience the resurrection. Not the guys, 
The girls did. The women did. Why? Because they made preparations in that dark, dark moment. I personally believe right now we're living in a life filled with limitations, right? We know that. And it can feel dark. I mean, when I look at what's going on in our culture right now, I don't remember any time in my life like this. The politics, everything. And it would seem dark. And I think you and I have a choice to make. We can choose to use this time for God to prepare us for what he's going to do next. Or we can just sit and grieve and be frustrated and be angry. And I really believe that we ought to make the next choice. If we're followers of Jesus, we ought to make the next choice, which is we know that God is always up to something new, that God is actually doing something right now, and we need to prepare ourselves for when this is over. And are we doing that? I love Paul's perspective as we've been reading um, Ephesians, because he says this a couple of times. He has this perspective. Paul, a prisoner of Christ, He's being held by the Romans, but he says a prisoner of Christ because he recognizes the circumstances that he's in are because God is allowing that to happen because Jesus wants him to be up to something in those circumstances. So he doesn't look at the limits. He writes these amazing letters. He has that perspective. So I believe that God right now is doing a work here in our community. He's doing a work in our country. He's doing a work in our world. God is readying the world for something that he's going to do that's significant. And I think we need to move beyond all of our feelings, all of our emotions, and want to live into the life that he's creating. And we need to live with great hope. We need to live with great expectation that God is going to achieve the work that he's doing. And he's going to redeem everything. He's going to make it right. So we're going to continue this morning in Paul's letter to this diverse young church. And he's reminded us at the beginning of all the work that God has already done. And he's challenged the church to continue to live into that work because they're going to continue the work of God. Um, They're going to continue the work of Jesus. He's going to do it through them. And they're united in spirit and purpose. So I'm excited for us as a church. And uh, we hold a high value here that we want to grow together. And in growing together, we become a better reflection of who Jesus is in the world. And I believe the Holy Spirit can work through us as we grow together. And so today we're going to talk specifically about what growing together looks like. So let me pray, and I'll, and I'll read the passage, and we'll focus in on it. So I'm in Ephesians 4, and last week we read through the gifts, the grace gift that God has given us, and our responsibility to, to live into those gifts, to equip one another, and to build up one another to be a full reflection of Jesus. And we're supposed to do that until it happens. We're supposed to measure up to the full, complete standard of Christ, and that would be Christian maturity. So beginning in verse 14, Paul continues, Then we will no longer be immature like children. We won't be tossed and blown about by every wind of new teaching. We will not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies so clever that they sound like the truth. Instead, we will speak the truth in love, growing in every way more and more like Christ who's the head of his body, the church. He makes the whole body fit together perfectly as each part does its own special work. It helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you uh, for this morning. Thank you for the opportunity to hear from you. Thank you for the gift of your word. Thank you for this letter written to a young church. Thank you for Paul's obedience. Even in the midst of extreme limitations, he saw hope, and he lived into that. Lord, I pray that you would open up our hearts, open up our minds, that you might speak to each of us individually, and I pray, Lord, that everything that I share this morning is helpful, it's truthful, and it's pleasing to you. In Christ's name, amen. So, uh, I remember when I was in second grade, I kind of had this moment that was really life-changing, um, you know, when you go to grade school and you're in kindergarten, first grade, I don't know how self-aware we are at that time. You know, you play, you go to school, you eat lunch. I mean, you just kind of, <laughs> you learn how to read, at least I was. Um, you learn all these math things and stuff. You go on the playground, you tend to play with kids. But for some reason, when I went into second grade, things changed a little bit. So as I was a second grader, I just remember going out on the playground, and there was a bigger world out there than just the little area that I used to play in. And in our elementary school, there was a big grass area. And when we were out at recess, there were older kids out there. There was third graders. There was fourth graders. 
And I remember being out there one day, and I heard some new language that I'd never heard before. I heard some really good F-bombs. I heard some of the other words that I, I just won't, I'll be respectful, not say them online. Same to you guys. But you know the words I'm talking about. You know, all those good four-letter words that um, aren't the most edifying. So anyway, I go, wow, those are cool words. The older kids are saying it. They're using them. So I go into my second grade classroom. And, you know, bless my second grade teacher, Mrs. Gaunt. Um, I come in, and, and I drop an F-bomb. I had no idea what the word meant. I don't even know if I used it correctly. Um, but she heard it. And she got on the phone. And so uh, my parents were called about the language I had used. Um, I was going to have to spend a little afternoon after school. And, uh, but I remember coming home. And, you know, my mom and dad, you know, gosh, what great people. You know, they, I, didn't get in, I didn't, like, get in trouble with it. My parents sat down with me in a loving way and explained to me about these words. And that they're not kind and that I shouldn't use them. And... From that moment on, I realized, okay, those words are not kind. And I held on to that truth as, as I grew up. And I'm not going to say I've never used them. But I, I realized the damage they would do to others. And I recognized, as I reflect back, as I went through school, life is kind of that way. You're, you're constantly being confronted with what looks, oh, this is what it means to be grown up. This is what it means to be grown up. This is what adults do. This is, and you, you sort of start taking all of these things on some of them are right, some of them are good, but then a lot of them, they're not. And you learn some hard lessons as you live into those things because we think that they're, they're truthful. So I've realized that as you and I move through life, we're intended to grow, we're intended to change, but I think we grow through imitation. And I think we imitate those that we give the freedom to influence our life. I am really grateful that as I grew up, that God graciously put people into my life who are followers of Jesus. Um, communities of people, the church that were followers of Jesus, what we would say is the body of Christ. They were sent into my life and they all took a responsibility to help build me up. They built into my life. They equipped me to growing into a person who could live and love like Jesus. And without those people, I, I don't know how my life might have gone. I am so grateful for those people. You know, it says um, in this letter that we looked at last week that God has given each one of us a portion of Jesus, a gift of Jesus. And each one of those gifts are intended to help others grow. And as we live into those gifts, one another, the individual unique gifts in each other's lives, we can be people who speak into others who want to find life and find a healthy life in Jesus. And we're called to do that together. We're called to, to do that until everybody is able to discover that life that we have found in Jesus. And I don't know about you, but we're all on that journey. And then I know a lot of people that haven't found it yet. They haven't found it yet. And so I think God's always preparing us for those moments through his spirit. And he wants us to be united in that. So, so what is it specifically that God's trying to do? that the Holy Spirit's trying to do? What is it that Jesus wanted? Well, Paul says it in the passage I read this morning. He says, grow in every way to be more and more like Christ. Or grow to become in every respect the mature body of Christ, who is the head, that is Jesus. So really, the intention of life is that we would grow every day more and more and more to become like Jesus. And Jesus modeled that life. So what determines that growth, that maturity? What, what really determines that? I really believe that Paul's giving us a real key here. Paul tells us in this passage that truth does. That truth does. He talks about how if you're immature, you're kind of being tossed all over the place because people aren't telling you the truth. You're experiencing the lies of life. Paul talks about this truth that we're supposed to come to know. What is that truth? I, I think today that, that's a big word in our culture right now. Right? Isn't it? I mean, we're hearing on the news. If you're on the news all the time, you're hearing about lies and fake news. And what is truth? And I hear people say this sometimes. Well, your truth is your truth and my truth is my truth. I, I mean, when I grew up, I, I thought there was truth. 
I thought there was truth. So let me remind us something. If you've committed to follow Jesus, you're a committed follower of Jesus, we have to reckon with these words that Jesus said. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. We've heard those words. Many of us say we believe those words, but I want you to stop for a minute and just think about the weight and the power of these words. Jesus is the truth. Jesus is the truth. There's a few moments in Jesus' life where this word comes up. There's a moment when Jesus goes out of his way to people you're not supposed to hang out with, the Samaritans, and he's at the well with the woman. And they're having this amazing, life-changing conversation that not only changes this woman's life, but changes the community that she comes from. But he says these words to her as they're kind of having a little bit of a religious conversation. He says, a time is coming and has now come when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such as these to worship him. God is spirit and his worshipers must worship him in spirit and in truth. Some of us love to study the Bible and you can do little word studies. And I kind of did that with the word truth this week. When Jesus said that word truth and it's written in this gospel, that word truth in the Greek is the same word that's being used as truth here. And as Paul, in his letter to the church in Ephesians, in Ephesus, every time that word truth is being used, it's the same Greek word for the word truth that Jesus used when he said, I am the truth. So you could replace everywhere you see that word truth with the name Jesus, and it starts to look different. Jesus is the truth. We're supposed to worship Jesus. We're supposed to allow Jesus to speak into our life. Everywhere you see that word truth, Jesus is the truth. So if we want to grow up in maturity, the lies don't look like Jesus, and the truth looks like Jesus. Jesus is our truth. Paul in this passage refers to Jesus as being the head of a body, and it's a brilliant image. We get it, right? We have our head and we have our body. The head has the brain in it. It's part of a central nervous system, and it's out of this that everything happens, right? And so as we are trying to navigate through our culture right now in terms of lies and truth and making life choices over what is truthful, what should I be living into and what should I not, not be living into, if you're a follower of Jesus, Jesus is the truth, so he should be the filter. So as you hear things, as you hear things from the television, which many of us watch too much of, or from social media, what would Jesus hear as he hears those things? What would Jesus think as he thinks about those things? How would Jesus respond? What would he do? That is our truth. What would his view be of everything that's going on? And if he had the opportunity to speak into it, what would he say? And then if he was going to act on anything, on anything, what would he do? Where would he be? Each one of us has a person of influence in our life. We are influenced by people. Everyone has that. And if that person isn't leading us as followers of Jesus into the ways of Jesus, then they're not leading us into truth. They're not leading us in the way. They're not leading us into life. We shouldn't give in to all of this other if we want to grow. You need to realize if you give in to all of this other and it's not the truth of Jesus, in a sense, you're separating yourself from his, him being the head of your body. And you're living into lies. And you know what happens is you become paralyzed. You don't grow. You don't grow. The enemy uses it. You just don't grow. Because you're not thinking like Jesus. You're not responding like Jesus. You're not living like Jesus. And so what happens is your life just becomes stuck. So one of the questions we have to ask ourselves, do the things that influence us or the people that influence us, so the influences or the influencers, do they look like Jesus? Do they live like Jesus? If Jesus is the truth, then I really believe we ought to let him be the influencer in our lives.
Paul, at the end of the passage that I read, goes on to say that we ought to speak the truth in love to one another. Many of us have taken that passage to say, we need to take these things when people aren't living right and find a loving way to communicate with them that they're not living right. And then what ends up happening is it's, it can become a judgmental thing. It can actually push people away from Jesus. But if Jesus is the truth, I believe what Paul's saying is, speak Jesus into people's lives. Speak Jesus into people's lives, and you're speaking love into their life. Are we speaking Jesus into people's lives? I believe the way we speak Jesus into people's lives today, more so than any time ever, is through our actions. If we live and love like Jesus, if we do the things of Jesus, that's going to speak Jesus into people's lives because everybody now is hearing tons of words. Words, 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 words. I believe we speak Jesus and love into people's lives if we act like Jesus. And then as we all do that in our amazing, unique way that he's created us, it's somehow, as Paul says, it gets woven together perfectly. And then we represent the fullness of Jesus out there in the world. So as Tom lives and loves like Jesus, the way God's wired him, and Clint, and Betsy, and Susan, Zedric, Phil, myself, as we do that, God just takes that and weaves it perfectly, and we begin to embody the, the real truth of what life is supposed to look like. Each of us has the privilege to do that. And my hope is that we would grow into a very healthy, loving community that reflects Jesus, and we do that together. We do that together. But we've got, to, we've got to look for the truth, and there is an absolute truth. There's an absolute truth, and it's Jesus. And if what you're hearing and what you're experiencing doesn't look like Jesus, doesn't sound like Jesus, it's not true. It's not true. Don't go that way. Let's follow the path of Jesus and you might find that there's a, a life there that you've always been looking for. And maybe, just maybe, all the noise is going to get quiet and you're going to experience this peace because Jesus didn't seem to be rattled by the craziness that was going on around him. He was able to just abide in that truth. Can I close? I want to close with this. This is Jesus' prayer for you and me in John 17. It, um, Betsy and I were talking about this this morning. It's just an amazing prayer. This is Jesus praying for us. So this is um, John 17, verses 20 through 23. This is Jesus praying to the Father. I'm praying not only for these disciples, the guys that are with him, the 12, but also for all who will ever believe in me through their message. That's us. I pray that they will all be one just as you and I are one. As you are in me, Father, and I am in you, May they be in us so that the world will believe that you sent me the truth. I've given them the glory you gave me. We all have those gifts. So that they may be one as we are one. I am in them and you are in me. May they experience such perfect unity that the world will know that you sent me and that you love them as much as you love me. Wow. Jesus wants us to be united in him, which means our lives are going to look like him. Our lives are going to look like him, and we can't do it alone. We do it in community, and we do it together. So let me just leave you with this question. What do you think, if Jesus could talk to you right now, and I believe he does through the power of the Holy Spirit, if Jesus could say anything to you now, what would he want to do in your life today to prepare you for what's next? What would God want to do in you today that would prepare you for what he's going to do next? What is the Holy Spirit trying to speak and do in your life to prepare you for what God is going to do next? I don't know about you, that gets me excited. That gets me excited. So as I do every Sunday, I'm just going to create an awkward moment here, a moment of pause. What did you hear from God this morning?
What did the Holy Spirit say to you? What did you hear from God this morning? And what's he asking you to do with what you heard? You are here, meeting every. 
find the way, the truth, and the life in your son Jesus, and that it would change everything. But Lord, you called us to build each other up, to equip each other, to become more and more like Jesus, to grow, to mature into the image of Jesus as each of us lays our heart. And then to speak, to speak truth into the world, to speak Jesus into the world. So Lord, I pray today, I pray for tomorrow, I pray for the coming weeks, Lord, that you would use our lives, our actions, in the lives of others to speak a significant truth that looks like Jesus so much so that they want to know what it's all about. What is this that we have found that they are seeking? Oh Lord, I want to pray a special prayer on all my family and friends as we go into this Thanksgiving. Oh Lord, I pray that you would watch over us and guard and protect us. I pray that you would continue to provide every need, that you would provide peace against every word. Lord, that you would guide our steps, that we would experience the peace and the hope that only come from you. Have your way with us, Lord. Have your way with us. Prepare us for what you're doing in us. In Christ's name, amen. So, uh, yeah, have a great rest of your Sunday, and uh, be safe out there.